Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Kemp from Crossref, and I'm joined today by Jen Gibson, Executive Director of Dryad, and Mike Nason, Scholarly Communications Librarian at the University of New Brunswick Libraries. I'll be covering Crossref today uh, in our talk about uh, stakeholder perspectives on open infrastructure, but Mike is going to start us off. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, being a librarian, yelling about uh, open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, if you know me, yelling is probably the thing uh, you know me the most for. Um, all the images in the slide deck for my own entertainment were created by Dolly, more or less. So if you uh, want to play along at home, you can try to figure out which cues I use to make these images happen. Uh, this is what I got for the phrase, a day in the life of a librarian yelling about open scholarly infrastructure. Uh, just trying to have a a little fun here, I guess. <clears throat> so number one, I'm a huge fan of open scholarly infrastructure, and I think it's really important. Uh, it's a public good for what I would say is countless reasons. And a lot of those reasons, it turns out, are pretty hard to explain to discrete audiences and stakeholders. There's a little bit of context. So I'm the open scholarship and publishing librarian, I guess scholarly communications. Uh, at what to most of you would be a pretty small school in Atlantic Canada. Uh, the University of New Brunswick RFTE is like 8,800, so not a super, super big place. Um, and my job, plainly, like, you know, my counterparts across the country are to make the research that happens at my institution as available to the public as possible. I also work for the Public Knowledge Project, who you have probably heard of in one way or another related to publishing, and also open infrastructure. I look like this. I am a white cis settler from the unceded, aka stolen territory. Uh, the Mi'kmaq Willisquay people is just a short hop from the Wollastook River, a much cooler name than the settler crowned St. John River, if you ask me. And that river is up here next to Maine, a state you rarely think about unless you are mad at Senator Susan Collins. Susan Collins is exceptionally great at finding excuses for you to be mad at her. So I am sure you have reason to know roughly where she is from. Uh, my institution, I think, is typical in this space uh, compared to a lot of other institutions. Uh, you know, we use OJS, we use open monograph systems, we have a DSpace repository, we had an Island Dora repository, uh, we use Drupal, we use Dataverse, sort of the, you know, regular sorts of things you consider uh, as platforms that leverage open infrastructure. And we're also working on being indexed by open air. We use Crossref, we use ORCID. Uh, we're a member of the ORCID CA consortium in Canada. Uh, we submit our content to Library and Archives Canada, which requires use of infrastructure in that space. Uh, we've used Unsub before. We're you know flirting with share your paper like so many people. We have funder and grant requirements at the national level, and we have OA policies and mandates. So these same sorts of universes, I think that for most people sound sound pretty typical. Uh, we also have, I put a little sap based cop stuff, that's like uh, Chris systems and metrics and, and stuff like that. Uh, also sometimes leverages open infrastructure. I spent a lot of time this week, uh, or more like this weekend, uh, thinking about what points I wanted to make at a library conference regarding open infrastructure and interoperability. I think a lot of this stuff is pretty well known about repositories and about open infrastructure, but you know, sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to the converted and sometimes I feel like my knowledge in this space is so specialized that people don't know any of the things that I'm talking about. <laughs> That's kind of the hard part when you're talking about this field. So, you know, on one hand, these pros and cons, ins and outs, ups and downs, to me, they feel very obvious. You know, uh, if you're on the marketing side or uh, bibliometrics, it's easier to tell your research story if you can actually tie the chapters together. And, you know, on a very basic day-to-day -day level, if I can slap a DOI in my repository and suck the metadata into it, that is a huge time saver and feels really good. But on the other hand, I think libraries and institutions are subject to a kind of magical thinking that can be both woefully ignorant and kind of full of unrealistic expectations about what open scholarly infrastructure means or they can conflate it with just open, right? Like we've heard a lot of people talk about promoting open for so long and they know what open access is and they think that open scholarly infrastructure is the same thing, uh, but really it isn't. And that and open source software, they're all they're all quite, quite different or have nuance uh, and they don't really know what it is that they're looking at. But on this third hand, <laughs> open scholarly infrastructure is inscrutable to so many people. A lot of people don't even know how a DOI works. Um, like, a, like a frankly profound amount of people don't really know how a DOI works. So there's this other piece where, you know, if you don't know how a DOI works, understanding how all of this stuff connects together can be hugely demanding. So there's this other major, major complicating factor here. So the number one point I wanna make is that interoperability is necessary 
to help us solve the problem of too many things. This is gonna seem maybe like a bit of review for some of you. This slide on the right uh, under what to publish is the conversation I typically have with researchers when I'm talking about modern publishing, where before they used to just publish an article in a journal and then they'd have a PDF or they'd have a proof or whatever, and, and then they would just go. They didn't really think a lot about it. But now they have to think about what they wanna share. They have to think about preprints and publisher PDFs and research data and where they share that information, how they share that information. So it's not just like, where will I publish anymore? It's how will I publish? And what will I publish? And obviously over the last few decades, this combination of like the serials crisis and the you know spread of open access, the immediacy of being able to share research uh, in a preprint server like Archive um, and efforts from Skullcom like librarians like me to help make these research products and byproducts so available has meant that a single work can exist in a pile of different places uh, and a pile of different versions and probably with variable metadata between each of them and unreliable or unclear relationships. So we've really worked to make work available to people and it is more publicly accessible and more eyes around work, but it's also less clear uh, how one work has kind of gone through its narrative of being written. I just wanted to go through this little thing just to kind of explain, because I think it was even instructive to me to think about it as I was making it. So I'm this happy researcher here at the top and I have a preprint. And I'm going to put it in archive and that's going to be open access, which is really exciting. So when I put it in archive, I'm going to tweet about it, uh, but I'm going to also deposit a copy in my IR, which is going to create a DOI in data site. And maybe I'll share a copy of that preprint on my web page. Uh, and then one of the co-authors, they've decided they're going to put it in their IR and that IR is maybe using CrossRef to make a DOI for that work. So then I apply to the journal. And while I'm in the process of applying to the journal uh, and I go through peer review, I get my author's accepted manuscript. Uh, so I have my accepted manuscript and I'm ready to put that into place. Uh, and I end up with a copy of it in PubMed. At the same time, my preprint ended up in another repository where they use Handle for their persistent identifiers. And it turns out that that one that was with Handle is indexed by OpenAir. So now my work's accessible in OpenAir. And I put a copy of my accepted manuscript in a repository. And now I have another data site DOI. Uh, and then I have a data set up here, a new thing that I have to share. And on top of that, my accepted manuscript is now deposited in an IR, but I use share your paper, which means there's also a copy in Zenodo. Uh, and that has a DOI. And then the data set's getting shared maybe by me to Zenodo and or Dataverse. And all of this stuff could have happened before the version of record is published. And then the version of record is the one that's getting pushed to my ORCID. Along these steps, everywhere I put a little green plus here is a place where potentially a new DOI could have been minted and registered with an agency related to that version. So this visual gets like pretty intense. This is one, one work. <laughs> We've really done this. Like when I talk about scholarly communications, I talk about how it isn't just the article. There's all these other products of publishing. And these are all the products that we could be sharing and the varying places that we could share them. And any of these individual places, if the relationships are not made clear, you can really miss out on the rest of the story. You maybe only find the preprint and you don't know where the final published version was, or you find a data set and then maybe the metadata is missing for where the published article is. So open infrastructure uh, and interoperability allows all of this stuff to kind of come together in a way that is a lot more coherent. Uh, but the reality is that we've got this huge zoo of places the material can end up. Meanwhile, there's a person in a library or a research office or awards office, people managing grants, trying to piece these things together and they're making this face. They're kind of like, oh my God, I can't even believe. Or researchers are making this face because you know somebody who was a co-author doesn't understand OA, but the other person's super into it. And now their work is in a million different places and they don't understand why. <clears throat> when I talk about open infrastructure, I always talk about it with this sort of like, uh, like strained reference to SimCity 2000. Uh, so if I'm talking to like undergraduate students, this is a complete lost cause. But I try to explain that like persistent identifiers are in the drinking water of scholarly publishing, right? The, the services that provide persistent identifiers, that's like the water main. You want your water main to be something that's like publicly funded. You don't want it to be proprietary. Uh, and also in the drinking water implies that they're everywhere. And, and they really are. Uh, almost everything you do is sort of sort of tracked or moved or shared by open infrastructure in this space. So this interoperability means that these systems and platforms can share metadata, they can expose relationships, improve access, improve retrieval, 
elaborate this narrative of research so you can kind of watch a work go from more or less start to finish in a sort of way, disambiguate works and save users time. And that's the kind of the biggest one when I'm talking to researchers, this can save you time. It's always the promise. Um, we'll talk about that <clears throat> a little bit further up. But also because they're open, there's usually a public API and many connected services are free. You're not being milked for usage data the way you would say in social media. And ultimately we can be less reliant on proprietary for-profit infrastructure, which is kind of the hope, right? Because that's the stuff that just gets sold back to you at a really high price. So again, you know, you don't wanna pay an exorbitant really high price for, you know, privatized water mains you want that stuff to be open infrastructure. When I explain to people that pushing our institutional or data repositories or OJS materials to open air contributes to this like global visibility of institutional research and may help wrestle a monopoly or oligopoly on public indexing away from one of the biggest tech companies on the planet, I feel like a kind of anti-capitalist wizard. Uh, I have a feeling that this, this Dolly prompt is gonna be very obvious, this anti-capitalist wizard. Um, Academia have put a sort of profound amount of eggs in Google's basket. Google loves canceling support for its various baskets. It can go whenever. So, you know, we're, we're really investing in uh, all the time, bending over backwards to make sure that this for-profit company, our work is being properly indexed in it. But if we focus those efforts instead on supporting the open infrastructure behind uh, projects like open air, then perhaps we can pull ourselves away from that sort of thing. Number two, open scholarly infrastructure is not magic. Uh, I do feel very strongly about this. Sometimes people complain about things for open infrastructure um, in, a, in a pretty big way. And the big one is usually bad or lazy metadata. Uh, most of the time, metadata is just a thing that kind of happens to researchers. That's how I feel about it. Typically, it's a thing you're doing and you don't really worry too much about it. Um, or some people, even if diligent, they end up in a situation where they have to shoehorn meaning into an Anglo-centric metadata field. It doesn't fit their culture. If you look into like Vietnamese names, none of them fit first name and last name or given name and family name in a way that makes any sense to them. Uh, but we require it because, you know, capitalism and uh, xenophobia and all, all kinds of other things. So good metadata requires both accurate specific schema and sufficient incentive to invest due diligence. And, you know, metadata is as important as it is boring. It's, it's really, really vital, but nobody's like excited about met. Well, I'm a little, but most people aren't excited about metadata. And open scholarly infrastructure isn't responsible for solving that boredom. So that's a problem we're gonna have to live with. And I think other people will have to incentivize. I also wanna speak a bit to this idea of open infrastructure uh, and open source software being sort of a different pace. So competing with enormous for-profit oligopolies is always going to be difficult. Um, open scholarly infrastructure is made by people, but people with a skill set where if they decided they wanted to go work for private or like venture capital funded projects may make more money. Um, you know, good willingly creating open software is rarely as sexy and pocket lining as working in private VC funded projects. Budgets are smaller, the swag is gentler. So sometimes we kind of wild out and complain about you know, what an organization that seems very huge is doing, but really it's it's very few people. Google Scholar is a great example. They do not have a lot of staff. It's like eight to 10 people or something. And everybody talks about Google Scholar like it's this enormous thing. I mean, it's part of an enormous company, but it's not a lot of people. Uh, we shouldn't, uh, or we should not be tempted, I guess, to think of the providers of open scholarly infrastructure the same way we think of vendors or big time service providers. Um, one time when we were just starting to take a look at unsub at my institution, our licensing librarian said, well, we should really get their support team on the line and they can give us a, one, a run through of all of their features. And I said, it's, it's two people. <laughs> like, they, don't, they don't have this big marketing department. You're not gonna have a liaison the way you had with ProQuest, a person that you know by name who's offering you deals. Like that stuff doesn't exist. Unsub is made by two people. So some of that open infrastructure is, you know, the, it, it, the people who built it are at capacity. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever had to have conversations with people around share your paper, like those guys are swamped. Um, they're doing so much. The staffing and resourcing is different. Vendors work really hard to get our attention and money. And the more they invest, the more we end up spending. But, you know, not-for-profits don't have that same luxury. Uh, and the last thing I really want to dig into here is just a little bit about the audience and how important it is to think about who you're talking to. So, these interconnections can sometimes make a person jump to conclusions. Like they try to consider, um, uh, for my audience when I'm discussing open infrastructure, stuff like, you know, will these people, when they find out about what ORCID does, start forcing staff to use it because they think it sounds so great, 
that they just want to make people do it? Uh, will they try to mandate DOIs in a repository so they can get the metrics? I've seen that lots of times. Uh, do they understand what a PID is? Do they know that a DOI is in some secret proof of legitimacy? My favorite publishing trend where people think that if you have a DOI, that means it was really published. Uh, that's a cute one. Um, you know, are they worried about where their work and information will go? Are they worried their employer will try to boil them down into a pile of numbers? You know, these are all legitimate concerns. And I think it's important to know that just, you know, every group is a little used to being exploited <laughs> in academia. Everybody's a little bit on their, their back foot. And this interoperability sometimes just further muddies already unclear waters. If you don't know what a persistent identifier is or what a DOI does, and then you find out that all of this stuff is interconnected and sort of automatically pushing data from place to place, you may get pretty freaked out. So people will ask questions, you know, is this good for my career? Does this mean I'll ever have to fill out a publication list again? Will this be tracked? Who can see it? Uh, what will implementation look like at my institution if I do this? Will it require labor? How much? Who will be responsible? So sometimes these decisions we make to support open infrastructure, even internally, can be a huge labor ask. If I say, we all need to use ORCID, and I turn around to my faculty members and say, okay, I need you guys all to use ORCID. They all have to spend time populating that ORCID record, which is maybe, you know, it's a non-trivial amount of labor if they haven't gotten one. Uh, and and it, it maybe is not a great thing to ask everybody to take on a huge amount of labor if you don't have a way to use that information on the other side right away. Maybe you should support them by, you know, offering them bursaries or something, an incentive to fill out their record record. All of this stuff comes with some kind of labor attached. Anyway, look, uh, as a Canadian and socialist menace, I just think that we should want infrastructure to be not for profit, public and transparently governed. Um, these orgs need to cooperate, but so many major players in open scholarly infrastructure are already transparently governed and they're already not for profit. You know, they're doing this work as best as possible. And the more they work together, the better off we are. Uh, open scholarly infrastructure is a public good uh, and that's me. Uh, so I'm gonna hand things over to Jen. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, that was incredible. And for future reference, if I'm asked to follow you as a presenter, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> <laughs> but I will carry on anyway. So um, much less interesting, um, but well, hopefully, hopefully we're going to cover on some a lot of the same topics. All right. So here, here's me. So um, so thanks, Jennifer, um, for the introduction as well, and for inviting Dryad to be uh, a part of the discussion. This is this is a good one, um, and I thought I'd approach it in in four parts. So I thought that I would say um, a bit about why I'm uh, enthusiastic about about open infrastructure, uh, and then talk a bit about how it works at Dryad. So I've taken a slightly different angle than Mike has in terms of PIDs, but I will speak a little bit more to PIDs now. I wanted to talk about what it's like on the ground, actually operating. Um, the, these things being some of those those two man teams again with the, in the interest of helping the community to understand a little bit about what it's like and, and how you can support us because we do need your support, which is my third point and then and then i'll, I'll say um, how what we commit to the community in in return so um so here goes um, but. I thought that I would first, you know, just offer some context about where I'm coming from. So just what is, what is Dryad again, just to remind you. So, you know, lots of folks know Dryad as a, a, a digital repository where, um, where, where data goes to sleep. And I want to emphasize that we're a very lively, you know, 15 year old um, open data publishing platform. So the bit where the PIDs come in is in the publishing. We need to organize the data in um, with publishing practice to help it to, to surface and be visible in, in, other systems downstream. So I would call that publishing and we, we do curate as well. But anyway, we're also a multi-stakeholder community of institutions and publishers and societies and one funder um, who are all committed together to, um, to achieve the, the open sharing and routine reuse of research data. So the reuse part is the, is the tricky part, but we're, we're committed. Um, the platform serves all research domains, so any data that doesn't have a home um, in a specialist repository and any data that's not inappropriate to share under a CC0 license has a home at Dryad. Um, we do only publish research data. Um, we redirect um, supplementary information and software to Zenodo um, and, and just double down on our, our skills in curating research data. 
We're interconnected on a couple different levels. So the first is with respect to other systems. So working with other aligned services like Zenodo um, is very important to us. We're here to support one another and not to compete for market share. So where we can find um, compatibility like that uh, um, is, is something that, that we wanna do. And we're interconnected on the level of the, the research object. So, um, so working with PIDs to connect the data to the preprint, to the software, to the DMP, et cetera, such that the person you, in working to use all that material can do so much, much more effectively. And that's, that's another way in which we're talking about the, the, the open infrastructure. So, so I guess two. I'm talking about it in two ways. One is the this global infrastructure that we're creating together, and the other way is um, is running a system, running a piece of, of infrastructure as we do at Dryad. So, um, so first, just a little bit of, of of enthusiasm from me. You know, I'm I'm personally very very committed um, to open infrastructure, and and the reason is that you know I didn't have the internet growing up. And so the, the extraordinary potential for knowledge exchange in an online environment that is free from legal and technical and financial barriers is, um, is captivating to me. Um, you know, I used to write letters to my mom from summer camp with a pen and some paper and then put it in the mail. And, and now we've got, you know, vi live video calls from, from London, England to, to Vancouver, Canada. Uh, Jennifer, you're outnumbered here. You've got two, two Canadians. Um, so, you know, the power of, of open in a digitally enhanced world is that researchers can exchange results in a much more rich and interactive way. And now I say researchers, but we, we must be cognizant of all of the folks who contribute to knowledge creation and, and exchange. So I do need to, to update my lexicon a bit, a bit there. Um, and this potential isn't limited to, to articles and books and data and protocols or software. It extends to the systems that we stand on, to the infrastructure that, that enables um, sharing of data and reuse, such as, as Dryad's case. So uh, the vision for where, where we could be, I think, is really, really well described by Jean-Claude Bergelman. So, um, so Jean-Claude was a past advisor on open access to the European Commission, and he's recently been named to the US National Academies of Science um, Board on, on re, uh, Research Data and Information. Um, in, in my, in my um, experience, he's, he's described the optimal process for research communication as one that's liquid. It's liquid. So to me, this means the ebbing and flowing without restriction, expanding and accelerating wherever it can go, like water. In an online environment, this is possible for research. This is, we can do this. Now I know there are all kinds of challenges, research assessment, you know, in achieving this, but I also know that, that we're making really imp important progress. So going back to open infrastructure, Jean-Claude actually compares this vision to what is happening with software. So in you know, open software development, there are established practices for building in the open and documenting versions. So um, you know, having open infrastructure theoretically means that a system can be iterated upon. It can be grown and, and improved um, much more readily because you've got lots more folks interacting um, with, with the code base. You know, again, what this looks like in reality can be more challenging. We've got to balance different interests from different parties. We've got to ask whether we want to be um, generic um, and or what it's like to be generic and relative relevant to, um, to different user communities. Um, we've got to ask questions around governance of the code and, and maintenance, all of that type of thing. But again, we're making really, really good progress. And I, I support this approach over one where the potential is cut off. You know, if things aren't in the open, we can't do any of this. We can't think about all these iterations and, and, and improvements and, and the potential for them. And I know that the library community, um, as Mike has said also, is sensitive to open systems as one strategy for ensuring that key bits of infrastructure continue to operate in the, in the community interest. And I'll say that uh, more about that in, in just a moment. So, so what I wanted to do next was just say a little bit about what it looks like at Dryad, what it's like to actually run a, a piece of, of op open infrastructure. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about our operations. I'm not talking here about the PIDs, but I, I think I have to do um, 
do uh, justice to my colleagues who design dryads such that um, you know, or an orchid is required for every author coming in the system. We're huge adherents to PIDs because of the potential for helping the data to surface in, in other systems. So orchid is required to come in the door for every data publication. We require funder registry information, ROAR um, for research institutions, um, OECD for, for research class classification. And I think those are all the things that are that are required. And then we collect descriptive metadata to help the, the data to be visible for um, for disciplinary study. So huge advocates there right on board um, with with what Mike was saying and um, hoping to iron out some of some of those kinks as well. We're, we're committed to, to open in, in everything. So our entire stack is um, is open source and all of our software and new releases are available on on GitHub. Um, we're based, in case you're interested, we're, um, we're based on an underlying Ruby on Rails um, data publishing platform called Stash. It was originally built by the California Digital Library and, uh, and Dryad moved, the Dryad Corpus um, moved on to the, that platform through our partnership starting in, in, in 2018. We went live in, in 2019, migrating from a, a custom instance of, of DSpace. We have three full-time engineers um, working on Dryad to do um, maintenance, application maintenance and, and feature development and optimization. We only build for ourselves, um, which is which is easier than when you're building for, for lots of, of different uh, interests. Um, but we do share code where, wherever possible. Our um, integration with frictionless data, I think, was, um, was taken up by uh, at least one other repository. And we do take input from the community. So getting getting input from all of our different stakeholders on, on what features we should prioritize is, is important to us. And then um, finally, the a part of our stack is to have an open API where um, folks can access the entire research data corpus or just the, the metadata to suck into to whatever system you like. So um, so just two, two closing uh, comments from me. One is that is that we need community support. And in this case, I'm thinking of, you know, academic and, and research institutions, but also um, societies and publishing organizations who will invest in Dryad as, as members. You know, our strategy for maintaining Dryad and ensuring that we build and grow in line with community needs um, is to serve a membership. So our members are um, institutions and, and publishing organizations. I want to emphasize publishing organizations, not publishers per se, because there are a lot of folks involved in publishing activity outside the traditional publishing house. Um, societies and that one research um, funder, and they invest in us to provide the curation, open sharing, preservation, and reuse of research in all fields. And to end, our members invest in us to ensure that this service stands on an open source system. Um, it's an, you know, an important part of our financial strategy, sure, um, but we, um, we hope it's a, a worthwhile investment because, you know, in turn, we commit to the community that our stuff will always be open. Um, we create channels for input on strategic direction um, for, through the community. There's representation um, in governance, you know, et cetera. And the principles of open scholarly infrastructure really have captured this very well. You know, the, our commitment to open infrastructure and, and open data and um, the, uh, the data and the software being available in perpetuity, even when Dryad as an organization becomes irrelevant. These are commitments that we've made to the community via POSI, and it's a, a powerful instrument, I think, for Dryad and other organizations to, to, to keep their, 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 uh, their interests aligned. So in, um, in my view, I, I feel this is a responsibility um, uh, by, by uh, agents in, in the space. And finally, I, I, I'm going to make a, a, a bit of a plea, and um, it's not unlike what Mike was saying in closing his slides. We need you um, to be attuned to us and to our value alignment and to not go with the easy sell from a vendor that has more resource and can, can reply more quickly. It's tough out here. It is a dense, competitive environment, and our sales teams, if we have them, don't consider themselves sales because they're more community-based. Um, they're just not as well-staffed or as numerous as, uh, as, as other um, organizations. We don't have package offerings or, or one-stop shops. So, um, so please, you know, read into value-based decision-making if you haven't already and, uh, and spend some time looking at open infrastructure options. Thank you. 
Um, I hope I didn't put you to sleep and I'll hand you over to, uh, to Jennifer Kemp to close us out. Thank you both so much. I think you've set me up very nicely. So I appreciate that. I hope I can uh, do justice to the rest of this. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks to Jen for ending on Posey. I'm, I'm gonna pick up from there because I think it might be useful to see just, just some of the specifics that um, this guidance provides both from and for infrastructure organizations. So um, one of the things that Posey does is provide this self-assessment. So what you see here is uh, from Crossref and hopefully it gives you just a little bit of, a, of the some of the specifics that are involved in things around financial uh, sustainability, policy, and transparency of operations. And I do think it, it's important to have this information available because we are all dependent upon open infrastructure, even those of us who are involved with it, because there are certain uh, interdependencies. So with that as just a little bit of backdrop, I wanna talk about Crossref. We are closing in on 140 million records. And um, what you see is sort of popped out at the top there are peer review reports and preprints of which we just passed the 1 million mark. And it's interesting because even as we've added in these other options over the years, the proportions that you see on the right in blue of journals and on the left in red of books have actually stayed about the same even as these things have changed over time. And to be clear, all of these records are openly available um, in a number of APIs. Um, but what I think might be most interesting about these numbers is what it doesn't include. So we know, for example, that um, in, the, in books, there are lots of chapter records that are not included in these numbers. So one of the things that we really try to focus on is what we can do to make it easier to get more um, of these outputs into the scholarly record. Um, I also want to note that uh, getting these records to Crossref and the use of them once they are available represents such a wide swath of uh, research and scholarly communications from the funders that provide the resources to do the research, the authors, the other contributors that do the research and write it up, the manuscript submission systems that often collect metadata initially, third parties that create and deposit metadata on behalf of members, which are both funders and um, publishers. And as Jen said, publishing organizations that don't, don't often think of themselves as publishers, publishing maybe a, a secondary or tertiary activity for many of these organizations. To the enormous array of downstream services that use this information once it becomes available, including, of course, librarians, and I'll, I'll come back to them shortly. But I do want to highlight the fact that um, even though I think we tend to think about infrastructure in terms of technologies and workflows, it's, it's humans, of course, that create and select and implement these technologies, as, as has been pointed out. So kind of behind all this work that we do, I think it's, it's worth calling that out and reinforcing some of the messages that you've heard already. So whether it's staff at these organizations or the community that works with us on things like interest in advisory groups or uh, involved in governance and development at Crossref, um, it's, it's certainly one of the most interesting and satisfying things for me personally is that because we work with such a broad cross-section of the community, we have the opportunity to kind of facilitate conversations around making improvements. And so just, just for one example, we recently wrapped up a call for comments around accessibility guidelines for DOI links. But coming back to libraries, um, again, I think you know often Crossref is associated in, in many of our minds, um, mostly with publishers, but libraries and librarians are a really big part of this community. So there are a number of different use cases, and Mike, of course, talked about scholarly communications, but libraries are really heavy users of the metadata, probably uh, most notably for open URL, which is used in discovery services, but, but lots of other use cases as well. 
um, including, of course, as members, um, you know, libraries as publishers as well. And I think it's really important to call out the community's use of this metadata because I think it's really a cornerstone of discoverability of these many millions of research outputs. I also want to give just a few examples of some of the kinds of functions and services that I think kind of fly under the radar a little bit or are or, 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 um, kind of buried behind the, high of the headline of registering um, outputs, you know, getting a DOI for outputs kind of thing. Um, so something like the similarity check plagiarism detection service that we uh, work on with Turnitin, and also data citations. Um, we've talked about this a little bit already, but I think it's a nice example of the kind of um, interdependence of different infrastructure organizations. So a journal article that wants to provide um, a citation to data, a data set that might be registered with um, data site that is hosted on Dryad, I think is a really good example of that kind of thing. Um, and so I collected a couple of months ago some of these examples um, into a, a, a blog post and just to, I won't go through these um, in any detail, but just to call out the very last one, the count of references. So publishers and their service providers will often send us references in their records, and that's great. We take those and count them up and we put the count of each and every record um, that has references into that record and make it openly available. So if somebody wanted to look at, say, what is the average number of references included in journal articles over the last 10 years and add any number of conditions to that kind of query, having this information in the metadata and having it openly available is one of those things that actually you know, makes it pretty straightforward. Um, and finally, I just want to put a, a little bit of context to kind of having all this detail in the metadata, all the people and technologies that go into this infrastructure. And that's our vision of the research nexus, which is all about getting research outputs connected up. So not just getting them registered, like the book chapters that I mentioned, not just getting them sort of fully described, like including um, data citations, but really connecting up things like funding to outputs and data to publications and, uh, and other things like translations and derivations, just making explicit a lot of these relationships so that they are available and they are interoperable. Because infrastructure supports a lot of these sort of tasks that, and functions and services that we've talked about. But I think it also really helps support a lot of the, the larger goals of the research community. So I thank you for your time, and I think we're all looking forward to taking your questions.